This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. All right, so Dr. Paul Abramson is a practicing medical doctor, former electrical engineer, and active participant in the quantified self community. He founded his private practice here in downtown San Francisco, and he is developing self-tracking technologies and a coaching model to empower patients to take more control of their health and health care. He is board certified in family medicine and addiction medicine. He teaches medical students at UCSF and still makes house calls. It's a very rare and unusual thing these days. Um, you may find him on Twitter as Paul Abramson MD or via his practice website, which is mydoctorsf.com. Uh, thank you, Mark. Hi, I'm Paul Abramson. Um, I got started with cycling in high school, sort of as an amateur, and then in college at Stanford. Uh, when I was an engineer, I rode with the cycling team. Um, eventually, broke my helmet a couple too many times and, and sort of retired from competitive cycling and I'm now more in the amateur category. I really don't have a lot of experience directly with professional cycling. Um, I have absolutely no conflicts of interest and I don't get any money from any, any manufacturers or companies. We're talking about gadgets, so it's kind of a product. We're going to mention lots of product names, so I, I don't have any conflicts there. Um, I'm going to try to focus this more on, it was a little hard to know who the audience was going to be in terms of levels of, of uh, athletes, but I'm going to try to focus it more on what, how we can use self-tracking technologies, both for health and also for, for cycling, but not so much in terms of like what professional teams are doing. Uh, a lot of them are using very, very advanced uh, uh, data management systems and, and all sorts of, of optimization things, but, but that doesn't really apply to most uh, amateur or, or semi-professional athletes. <laughs> So why, why do you want to gather data? Um, I'm, I'm an engineer, so I fall into category one, you know, thinking about feedback loops and controlling systems and wanting to converge on a solution. Um, but there's also a whole school of thought uh, for, about if you can get feedback from your data, it might help to motivate you to make change and to help you to understand yourself better. And then the coaches also just want to know what's going on, and I think there's if you're in a very supervised team training environment, there's a lot of direct observation, but most people are training on their own and, and much more independently, and their coach or their trainer or whoever's advising them may not really have a good idea about what's going on, and this is potentially a way to, for people to gather more information to help the ones who are trying to help them. So um, self-tracking is currently in the media a lot. It's been very much in the popular press. This quantified self movement is a kind of hobbyist community similar to the PC users groups back in the 80s and, and 90s, of real geeks who are getting together and sort of measuring themselves and doing experiments on themselves. Uh, but it's now sort of broken out of that, that um, obsessive, compulsive uh, uh, minority. Uh, and, and now there's sensors, there's gadgets, all the major, you know, it's, it's just everywhere you're getting all sorts of gadgets to track yourself and measure yourself. And really what I've been interested in my medical practice is what, how, do you, how can you use a lot of these tools to actually help yourself as opposed to as a, as a novelty item? Um, so there, most of the commercial gadgets out there that you might have seen are really not applicable to cycling because they are mostly glorified pedometers. And they don't work if you're on a bicycle. So there's the Fitbit, there's the Body Media Fit armband, there's the Nike Fuel Band, uh, mostly completely not. But if you're a cyclist, you also have activity off the bike. 
and you're doing cross training and you're doing maybe you're a multi-sport athlete and some of these can be very helpful in figuring out what your um, energy expenditure is uh, on and off the bike and and they're generally kind of interesting and 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 they're getting to the point where they're actually pretty usable and unobtrusive uh, to gather step count energy data probably the best quality data is from the body media armband the one on the left i'm wearing there um, because it actually gets your skin temperature and the ambient temperature and a galvanic skin response so it knows if you're sweating and if you're hot maybe you're exercising whereas if you're not maybe you're in a truck on a bumpy road and it won't give you 20,000 steps. Um, <laughs> so, whereas the fit, my, my experience of the Fitbit is you go on a bumpy road and, and you look really good on your activity <laughs> level. So, um, but these, you know, these are not high fidelity professional medical devices at all, but they're, they're, pretty, they're pretty interesting to use for trends and, and comparisons. So, I was, I won't disclose exactly when I was racing at Stanford or riding, and um, it was a long time ago. There was no quantified self-movement, you know, there were, but there were gadgets, and there were devices, and we were all tracking. Um, the cycling computer was definitely around when I was a teenager, and, uh, but back then it was cadence and heart rate, maybe, mostly just cadence and speed and distance. Uh, there was no GPS, there was no mapping, there was no power meter. Um, but now uh, we've really, I think all those things are still useful, uh, but we're looking at power output, which is actual muscle power output, more than like your heart rate, which is more of a cardiovascular measure. Um, we're looking at heart rate variability as a measure of training intensity and overtraining, um, and potentially also stress and uh, relaxation. And, um, and then there are all sorts of people who are more into the subjective measures of perceived energy expenditure. So by paying attention to what you're doing, uh, you can quantify your workouts, you can guide your training, you can track your, your performance over time. And this is not new. Um, so cycling computers are no longer just simple um, cadence and, and distance. Uh, they're now pretty advanced computers. A lot of them are integrating with smartphones. Uh, Garmin is an old company that's been around doing this for a long time. Their devices are, are, are still, they have a lot of legacy technology involved, so they're, they're often a little bit clunky. Um, but there's a lot of newer stuff. This, uh, I found the, in doing research for this, there's a, a company, I think it's in Finland, uh, called Liker that's making a sort of like the cycling computer you would dream of. If you could, <laughs> it's got a really high resolution screen, it's got a good battery life, it tracks everything, it has AMP Plus, so it can integrate with all these different devices. And, um, and it's not out yet, so, but you can go. <laughs> <laughs> but they're I think they're taking pre-orders or something like that. But that's, that's about the coolest new one that I've been able to find. Um, Wahoo is a company that use, makes basically iPhone apps and devices that, that sync with, with iPhones. Um, so they, they have actually a case where you can actually put your iPhone on your bike as the computer or a bunch of other ones that actually will, you can keep your iPhone in your back pocket and they just sync, uh, sync through your phone. So you can now get any number of other metrics directly on your, on your bike. Um, power tracking, um, power combines your cadence and your actual torque and it gets your actual muscle output. So a lot of, in, in more recent years, that's been, um, a focus of something to track that's a little more directly related to your to your fitness level, um, and it and it's really muscle activity, not just your your heart. You are looking at your skeletal muscle, um, and it's also not really affected as much by the environment, temperature, how excited you are, your altitude, stimulants, whether you're hungover. Um, power is, is it's a much more direct measure of your performance. Um, of course, power meters and a lot of the devices to track that are a lot more expensive than cadence meters. Uh, so not everybody will necessarily want to shell out $1,000 for so they can track their power. Um, but it's actually, there's more, we'll talk about some of the devices. Um, kind of the gold standard that I'm, as far as I'm aware, is the power tap. It's actually a hub for your wheel, so it's tied to your wheel. Um, and it directly measures power at the, uh, at, at the uh, place where the torque's being applied to the wheel. And uh, there's actually a, um, a home trainer that you can put your bike on that integrates one of these power tap hubs and also now comes with a um, 
a, a virtual reality system that builds it in, and it will actually change the resistance on your trainer, you know, based on what um, what geography you're you're cycling over in your living room. Um, so, and then there's another one, the Wahoo Kicker, which is um, in, it's a, another um, a home trainer that integrates with another map application on your on your computer. So um, the only disadvantage to the to the PowerBeam Pro Cyclops one is it's Windows based. So uh, it doesn't run natively on a Mac, so that was that was kind of a bummer. Um, and then some of some other power meters that are starting to try to bring the price point down. Um, actually, the Cork isn't really that much cheaper, but it integrates with the um, with the chainring and the and the uh, cranks on your bike, so it's not tied to the wheel. So you can swap out wheels. Um, the iBike Newton is actually just a cycling computer. It sits on your handlebars and it looks at the the air movement coming in and how fast you're going and other cadence and things like that and sort of does a calculated measure of your power output. And it's they claim to be very accurate, but I'm not, I, I wasn't really able to objectively validate how accurate it is, but it's a lot cheaper than, than some of these very expensive um, uh, things that integrate with your bike. So that's some of the bike stuff. Um, there's this thing, thing called relative perceived exertion, which is sort of saying, well, why, why do you really need to measure all these things? Why can't you just say, <laughs> you know, one's easy, 10, my eyes are bleeding. I thank, <laughs> I thank my brother, um, Mark, for that, that uh, little image. And, uh, <laughs> and um, this is actually something, I mean, if you're, if you're using a power meter, you get the data, it syncs to Strava, or it syncs to Training Peaks, or whatever platform you're using, um, this is something you would have to actually track yourself. And so we'll get into some ways that you can track things that require your subjective experience. And I guess I'd, I'd like to just segue into this. There, there are kind of two kinds of tracking that you can do. There's passive tracking where you just do what you're doing and the, these magic devices measure you and record data and you don't have to think about it. And the other is active tracking where you actually have to be aware of your experience and think, oh, I'm having a headache, or oh, I'm, I'm feeling tired, or oh, I'm you know, having some ex distress, and whatever you're, tr you're interested, and then you think, oh, I'm going to record that. And a lot of people are very strongly biased toward passive tracking because you don't have to do anything. But what we found in doing this, at least in medical practice and some with athletes, is that actually having to be a little more mindful about what's going on in your own body it builds a sense of awareness of what's going on for you. And so the active tracking gets people more engaged in what they're doing. Whereas the passive tracking, it's, you can generate gigabytes of data really easily, but then looking at it's really hard um, to actually go through your data and try to figure out what it means. So um, heart rate variability is something I'm very interested in personally, you know, in my, in my medical practice. Um, I haven't seen it as much in sort of the cycling literature, but it's being used a lot by professional sports teams outside of cycling. I, don't, I actually don't know what they're doing, whether they're using it on, in cycling right now. Um, but basically, you're, as you breathe in and out, your heart rate changes. It's called a sinus arrhythmia. It's normal. Um, and if you breathe in, your heart rate gets faster. And as you breathe out, your heart rate slows down, and that's normal. And it turns out that the variability in your heart rate changes depending on how stressed you are, how, basically how stressed you are. So if, you're, if you have a, a Zen meditator who's very experienced, their heart rate variability will be very great, and it will actually get into a really nice sinusoidal synchronized pattern, whereas someone who's highly stressed or overtrained and, uh, and exhausted will have a very flat, not, not very variable heart rate. So you can use this, and there are apps now, the iFleet app, and, and a lot of these newer heart rate sensors can track beat-to-beat -beat data and get what they call the RR interval, between, the interval between the, the heartbeats, and allow you to, to see whether your um, heart rate, you know, you get up in the morning, if your heart rate variability is really low, uh, it's a sign that maybe you're, you're, you're behind on your rest or you're overtraining. So that, that can be very good. And then in, in other contexts, you can use this as a surrogate marker for fatigue, for stress, for depression. And, and that is, um, it's kind of interesting to, to try to correlate that with other things. So um, there's this awesome device called the Zephyr BioHarness that probably no one's going to want to get because it costs $700 for a chest strap. Um, the price has come down a little bit, but you know, it used to be more. Um, but this is actually being used by professional sports team, by army special ops teams, 
Um, it will sync through a smartphone. It can also sync through military radios, sat phones. Um, and you can have 30 people on a field all wearing these. And on a laptop, the coach can be seeing everybody's heart rate, heart rate variability, breathing rate, VO2, you know, their, their energy expenditure, their, and, um, and be able to spot the athletes that are working hard, like in soccer or uh, football. They'll see who's slacking, who's working hard. They'll yell at them. Um, it really is... Um, a very, very impressive system. Their technology, unfortunately, is a little clunky. Uh, you can't really integrate with it. They don't have an API. They don't have any sort of, um, it's all Windows-based. It's, kind of, it's kind of unfortunate in a way, but, but it's actually in practice. And, there's, and they've got it integrated with the shirt, you can see here. And if you actually look um, at the Combine, the NFL Combine, they're all wearing these. And the, and the uh, coaches and everything are watching their biometrics in real time uh, during, the, during the, the draft combine. So uh, it's a little spooky, actually, but it's, uh, but it's pretty cool stuff. And I think the next generation of, of this is going to be cheaper and much more accessible. Um, so I think the word is that Strava is sort of what a lot of cyclists are using. Uh, but there are a lot of these different websites that will sync to your devices and allow you and or your coach or trainer or, um, or friends to share your training data, your diet data, your um, energy expenditure, your roots, and all sorts of things. So it's, you know, it's getting better. Um, I would say in the old days, it was, it was hard because it was very cumbersome. And I think it's, it's working a lot better now. And there's a lot more ways to aggregate your data. But it really is tied to these various devices. So if you actually want to track subjective data that's custom to you, it's hard. And there's not a good way to do it. So so uh, there are other efforts to build systems that can pull from this and then pull from other data sources and allow you to, to look at a bigger, a wider array of data. But this is, um, and uh, then the last thing that people use to track is sort of how do you measure your, your baseline fitness level? How do you track, track that over time, your body composition? Um, I like to plug the San Francisco State University Exercise Physiology Lab. This is like, the best screaming deal to go get your body composition and your and your uh, exercise physiology done. Um, you get a grad student, you know, spend an hour with you explaining it all and doing all your biometrics um, for for relatively cheap compared to what's what's available commercially. So you can do a VO2 max testing. You can do lactate threshold. This is ways to measure your level of um, of fitness essentially to get some baseline data, um, and then. You can also do body composition testing because there are all these devices that you might see where you step on a scale and it uses bioimpedance to measure your body fat percentage. Like you can get these at home. They're very inexpensive. They're also really wildly inaccurate. But they are <laughs> um, because they're very dependent on your body water. So your hydration status can dramatically change the results. Um, so a lot of people will go and they'll get a gold standard test, correlate it to their home scale, and try to figure out how to use their home scale for relative measures instead of a, an absolute measure. So the, in terms of um, body composition, the gold standard has always been the dunk tank, the water displacement method, which where they see how much water you displace, they weigh you, and they use a formula to calculate your, your percent body fat and your fat mass and your muscle mass. Um, the, uh, there's something, a device called a bod pod, which uses air displacement. It's a pressurized capsule that you get into. It turns out it's no less annoying than having to get in the dunk tank. You still have to wear a, a shower cap, and you still have to wear a, um, a Speedo. And, and so you don't get wet, though. So if you're afraid of water, you can do that. Um, and then there's the skinfold caliper technique, which actually can be very accurate in good hands, but you have to know what you're doing. And it can be very variable depending on the operator. So a good personal trainer who's been properly trained can often get great results with skinfold uh, calipers. Um, the other one that's not here is you can actually use uh, what's called a DEXA scanner. Turns out there's nobody in San Francisco is doing this. The nearest one is, I think, Redwood City, uh, where they use a low-dose x-ray like they do for bone density, but they can actually see your, your, your fat mass and, and um, calculate your body composition. And that's very accurate, but it does involve x-rays. So, um, so and then what the, the sort of trick that I've learned for using those bioimpedance scales is you get up in the morning and you drink a liter and a half of water <laughs> fast and then you wait 40 minutes and you pee and then you step on the scale 
and that will let your kidneys kind of equilibrate your body water. And I found that it was fairly, it was much more reliable that way. So um, it's hard at four in the morning to do that. But um, so I also found this smart bike helmet. This is also not released yet, but um, it's made by a company that makes heads up displays for fighter pilots, I think in, in Israel. And now they're making a bike helmet that it kind of almost implies that there's a heads up display in this bike helmet. There's actually not. Um, so what it is though, is it has a heart rate sensor and a skin temperature sensor, and it can do a lot of these biometric sensors without wearing a chest strap. It's just all in the helmet. And then it theoretically could sync to your cycling computer or other, other devices. So it sounds kind of cool. Um, if you didn't have to look down, if it really did have a heads up display, that would be, that would be great. But maybe Google Glass will, <laughs> will provide that. Um, <laughs> so um, the, now this is a, the why things, this is a company that makes wireless gadgets. Um, they have a scale that has a little bio impedance in it and it syncs through your Wi-Fi, and so you can track your weight um, on a website. You just step on the scale and it automatically uploads everything. So that's costs about you know four times as much as a similar scale without that feature. So, and it's a kind of data that you could really write down per, on a pa piece of paper pretty easily, but it, it does. <laughs> Um, it does get cool, fa maybe you're gonna weigh yourself more frequently and if, you, if you use this. And it does sync to your platform with all your other data, so that's nice. Um, they also make a really fancy blood pressure cuff made, designed in France with a fluorescent green cuff and it, and it plugs into your iPhone and you can track your blood pressure. And it's pretty accurate, I've correlated it with gold standard blood pressure cuffs, it seems pretty accurate, but, but it's like $140 instead of 40 for the Omron 742. The best blood pressure cuff, if you want to get one, their single is on Amazon, is Omron 742. That's sort of a nice, instead of going to Walgreens, just go get that. Um, because it's a lot, it's sort of medical grade and cheap. Um, sleep tracking, I know a lot of athletes are not paying attention to their sleep. Um, it's, you know, the pro teams are very concerned with that. I think it's actually critical to track your sleep if you're an athlete um, because it probably affects you more than almost any other single thing. Um, and it's not just quantity of sleep or even your perceived quality of sleep, but it's actually your sleep architecture that affects your energy level, your recovery, your mental function. Um, if you think you have a medical sleep disorder, you should go get that tested by, you know, a test that can really only be ordered by a physician. But if you kind of have a hobbyist approach to, you know, if you don't need diagnosis of sleep apnea, if you just kind of want to track your sleep over time, there's this great device called a Zio um, where you actually put a headband on and it is a three lead frontal EEG and it tracks your sleep stage through the night. And it's actually fairly accurate in about 60, 70% of people in my experience. So it's actually, some people it just doesn't match their brain waves and it, it gets wrong data. Um, but and some people can't tolerate wearing a headband at night or they, it falls off or various things. So um, unfortunately, because of all those little logistical things, the company just announced last week that it's going out of business. Oh, no. <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm waiting for them to get bought because it's actually a really cool device, um, but you can't get it anymore. It's not, you know, all you can buy is the headbands. Now you can't buy the device. <laughs> so um, sorry about that. But then there's, and there, it's been replaced by all these little iPhone apps and different things that claim to track your sleep but they're really not accurate. And so, um, so this was my local favorite and I, and I you know, was really excited about it for a long time, but they, it's just, they didn't have a good business model, unfortunately. People bought it and then they used it for a while and they didn't use it and then, yeah. So, um, but I've been tracking my sleep almost every night for about two years and it's, it's interesting to look back on, on things later. Um, and it's also interesting if I, now I know if what a good night's sleep feels like, and that's a very helpful thing to, to, to know. Um, oh, and by the way, if you need to be evaluated for sleep apnea, I should just say that you can now have that done at home. You don't go need to do, go f sleep in the lab for $5,000. So um, don't let anyone tell you you have to go to a lab to get evaluated for sleep apnea, but it has to be prescribed by a doctor. Um, the Lumobac is the only sensor I'm currently wearing um, every day just because I think it's so awesome. And this is actually completely relevant to cyclists because cyclists have terrible posture. You're hunched over on the bike, you're hunched over at the computer at work, and, 
and cyclists tend to just have terrible posture. So um, this is a, a little waistband, I can't actually show you, it's under my clothes, um, that you wear and it detects your pot when you slouch. So um, I actually, I wish I had had more slides, but it has a, an iPhone app, you can see this little stick figure and it's standing up straight and green and then you, you slouch and it turns frowny face and turns yellow and, um, and, it, and then you slouch for five seconds oh, and, it just, and it vibrates. And so um, for the first week I wore this, I was so sore because I, I didn't realize it's, I, I wasn't, you know, all of a sudden I was standing up straight and using all those muscles and it was, it was agony for about a week and a half until I started to get into shape. Um, and it also is a pedometer and it also tracks your sleep position and how, how long you're asleep. And it, it's a really cool little gadget. Um, and so of, of all the sort of commercial devices, I think this is kind of the the most relevant to health and you're actually gonna benefit. Whereas tracking your step count, if you exercise more, that's great. But a lot of times it's just, it's just more numbers to not pay attention to. That's what you, you can't get too, atta I, in my pract medical practice where we're doing all this self-tracking, in my personal self-tracking when I talk to people, you can't get too attached to any given gadget or sensor. Like we're, we, we, we call ourselves sort of sensor agnostic because if you, they go out of business, they get antiquated, somebody else does it better, and if you get too locked into one sort of platform and one company, you can get all, and, and you give them all your data, and they go out of business, you might not really be that happy with it. So it's very important to try to focus on you and then try to figure out what tools you can use, and if possible, keep your own data uh, and download it and, and keep it on your own servers because at some point it may be, it may be gone. Um, so um, putting it all together, so we're developing sort of in the medical practice model, and we are working with athletes, and I, I guess a majority of people just with medical issues they want to improve in health problems, weight loss, you know, inflammatory bowel disease, um, all sorts of, of mystery symptom complexes, uh, but then also with athletes and people who want to accomplish goals and track themselves. So we're, we're developing sort of a new role for someone who's not a doctor who um, called a quant, we're just calling it the quant coach because they tend to be helping people manage their data. Because what we found is that if you go give people gadgets and tell them to track and tell them to summarize their data and come back to you, they don't. Um, and, or, they, or, they, or they do it for a while and then they get burned out. And it's really hard to look at your own data. And I know in the cycling training world, um, the data you're looking at is a little bit more direct and a little more concrete when it's when you're trying to do explore, exploration and a lot of athletes we're working with we're actually not dealing with the nuts and bolts of calories in and power meters and we're dealing with the symptoms and their sleep and all the things that are affecting their training trying to optimize you know they might have asthma and we're trying to figure out what's their asthma trigger so that they can be a better cyclist um, so we're doing a lot of the self tracking is not sort of the standard cycling computer self-tracking. It's, it's tracking other things to try to um, help with their cycling. So in the medical model, we kind of may have a doctor and a dietitian and, and, this, and the patient and the quant coach, and we design experiments and tracking, and then we, the coach and the patient meet every week to talk about their data. And so the coach is really taking on the burden of keeping them on track and helping them to do experiments rationally so they can actually learn something. Um, and so maybe in a we haven't worked directly with team coaches yet. We've been more working with more like a quant coach and a doctor and a cyclist and a dietitian. But you could use this model, and this is Lauren, our, our quant coach, the first ever quant coach, um, who's in Hawaii right now and couldn't be here. But the quant coach helps the, the person, the, the athlete, does it develop a self-tracking program, getting priorities from the, the participant, the trainer, the dietitian, helps them figure out all these gadgets and how to use them and where the data goes and how we're going to look at the data and then does that and then actually reviews the data gives people feedback helps them to iterate on their on what they want to measure how they want to measure it and then um, dynamically adjust the training program so you can give feedback to the to the coach that really actually the issue here and we'll have people take pictures of their food um, instead of trying to log food on, an, on, on a website. Um, and we'll have people track, you know, if they have asthma, we'll have them track their asthma symptoms actively. Uh, or they might use a peak flow meter, and then we'll, we have, we have uh, 
data-enabled peak flow meters for asthma or for headaches or for GI symptoms on the, on the bike. Um, and so you gather baseline data, you, and you basically iterate on sort of N of 1 experiments with people. Which And there's a long literature about doing N of 1 experiments in the medical literature going back decades. Um, but it's been under underappreciated until until recently when we're actually starting to do see more of that. It's it's the day of the randomized controlled trial is the only valid um, model is is waning. I think there's more there's more um, appreciation that there are other models of study. Um, so um, active tracking. This is just an example of an app, the app that we use to. Um, it's not actually. Uh, publicly released yet, but it's called MyMe, where you can basically set up buttons for whatever you want to track. Your water intake, your headaches, your waist circumference, your, um, your perceived exertional effort. You can, and, it, and it just basically streams it all to a database where you can look at it alongside all of your other data. So this is a picture of my dinner two nights ago. And, <laughs> and it just goes in there with all the other data. And then when you want to look at it, this is just one of the visualization tools that we're using. Um, you, you have all your pictures, you have your symptoms, you can pull in your activity data and your any pretty much any data. We have connectors to almost all the different devices and platforms. So, so you can just pull it all in and then look at it in different ways. And most of all, your coach, your, your coach can do that and help you to find some meaning in it. Um, this was not a, a fitness-related thing. I was actually, this is my data from... Oh, when was it? 2012. I was trying to figure out headaches. And so I was tracking sleep, and I was tracking my mood, and I was tracking my food. I thought for sure it was something I was eating. or And actually, down below where you can't see, I was tracking indoor air quality with a indoor air quality meter and barometric pressure and I, all these different things. And, and it turned out what it was was sleep, but not how much sleep. It was when I felt tired, when I noticed my eyes closing, at 9 p.m., I have about 20 minutes to get to sleep, to get to bed. And if I don't, I have a headache the next day. It's very reproducible. And so I, my headache frequency is now, you know, once every couple of months instead of once a week. Um, but, and that was, that was sort of a, a rare win where it's like there is an actual one thing wrong that you can fix. Um, usually it's a little more complicated than that, but, um, but yeah, so that's, that's one potential use of this kind of self-tracking. And I did that on my own. And the only reason I pulled it off was I had to give a talk, and I was motivated. <laughs> and I was, so I was like gathering data, trying to find something that I could that I could talk about. And, I, and so, but it's really hard to look at your own data and and find meaning in it over time. Um, so, uh, in the medical world, we can do all sorts of experiments identifying environmental, dietary, emotional triggers for symptoms. You can do experiments. You can try a new supplement. You can try a new medication and see what happens in a very controlled fashion. And in the cycling world, maybe you can feed up the training or speed up the training loop. I know that the, um, I haven't seen this yet, but there's a documentary being made about the, um, the women's uh, track team in the 2012 Olympics that took an unexpected silver medal. Um, they tra started training just right before the Olympics and had no resources. And they used a lot of this kind of closed loop self-tracking technology and feedback to achieve an advantage over all these other much better funded teams. And they're actually making a whole documentary about it that's going to be out in a year. So, and maybe, you know, get beyond just the pure optimization of your food and your, and your ride schedule and your, um, you know, style of your training, but get all the other factors that affect your training, your food, your hydration, your sleep, your mental training activities, um, and identify over training and stress and burnout, and then actually maybe enhance your motivation when you have more support around the details. So, um, so but it's really not just the data. Um, data does serve to trigger your memory. And so what we found is you can't really track enough to put it into Google or you know some algorithm and it will spit out the answer. Um, even, with, even with ride data and training data and power meter data, you really can't you can. I mean, they're, they're, they are doing algorithmic data with, with pro teams. But, um, but really what happens is when you prompt the person, you say, well, you didn't take pictures of your food for, for a whole half day here. What happened? And then they, if it's soon enough after that, if you're really meeting with them every week, um, they'll be able to tell you the story. And that's actually much more actionable than the pictures of the food were. 
Um, so the tracking itself is a trigger for people's memory if you use, if you elicit that story. And so you have this narrative, your idea about what's going on in your life and your training and everything, and then you actually test that narrative and you revise your narrative and you go round and round. So um, I'm uh, pretty easy to find. And if people have more questions, uh, we do have a few minutes. So um, I hope this was, this was helpful. It's, it's a big topic and, um, and it's kind of exciting times. I'm, I am actually rather optimistic, mostly, except there. So, okay, thanks, yeah. Yep, okay, the question is, um, what do you do with the food pictures? Great question, um, and, and in general, how do you track food? And maybe um, there might be some people who are better at this than I am. I have, back when I was riding competitively and then I was running competitively, I have done the spreadsheets and I track food and I do all the calculations and I don't know, I have a serious sort of OCD trait, um, not a full diagnosis, but, um, <laughs> um, and it really fed, it, it was, you know, really, it's very hard to do long term. And even the new apps where the, you can build your own databases and track your food, it's really hard to track details. And so uh, we found that actually you get 90% of the information from a subjective picture of food. So you can, there's someone advertising an app where they send the pictures to some Asian outsourced group of people who look at the food and measure it and calculate the calories and will send you back your data about what the food, what's on the plate. Um, I, I don't think that's actually um, panned out. So, and nor do I think it would be that helpful. So, um, if you look at pictures of food, it's really to start a conversation, and it depends on what your goals are. If you really are looking at a very high level training where you really need to know every gram of protein and and, and uh, fat protein ratios and all that, it, you know, then sure, you're gonna wanna track much more on a much more granular level. But that's very labor intensive, even with the best technology. So really what you're trying to do is try to figure out overall, and this is looking at much longer time spans than like a two week lead up to a race, what, how does food affect your performance and your symptoms and your sleep and what can you change about your food you know, really, really, it's it's much more less nitty gritty when it comes down to what's actually useful. So we'll have the coach looking at the pictures of the food and talking about their goals and saying, you know, we can't quite calculate all the numbers, but it doesn't really look like you're sticking to what you say you're sticking to. I mean, you can really get an idea. Or, or you wrote down here you had a, a snack of of almonds. But looking at this picture, it looks like about 900 calories of almonds. <laughs> you know, and we can, you can guess. And, um, and that's often good enough to start a, you know, so around the food, we, we thought about tracking much more granular food, and we found out that people just wouldn't do it, mostly. Um, and there are exceptions to that. So, yep. Is that because of the electromagnetic fields? Or what, what was the reason not to wear a watch to bed? I think the number one lesson I've learned from all of this in every context is that, you know, in order to pull off real self-tracking, you either have to have a goal or a problem that's really motivating you. You have to have a, I mean, especially with like a medical context, if someone has a little minor something or other and you sick them on this big self-tracking project, it's not going to last. But if someone's really desperate and they've tried everything and it's really affecting their quality of life, they'll go to any end to get an answer and to figure it out. And so, um, yeah, the whole bed hardware thing, it's, <laughs> it's, it's problematic. And, 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 you know, I have gotten lots of comments about my, you know, all the different things that I have over the past few years worn while in bed. And so I, I don't think that's... Um, <laughs> So um, yeah, I, I would just <laughs> I would just say you know it's it's a very individual process, and you need to find out what what works for you and what you want to accomplish, and and if this is necessary or not, because it's not not always necessary. Yeah, yeah I mean, what I've heard more about is sleeping for an hour and a half, four times spread out through the day, like these. Uh, I've, I'm. I'm not remembering the exact name, but yeah, various schemes to, to, imp to require less sleep. Um, and it turns out you can. You can go on these um, segmented sleep patterns where you actually, your total sleep need is much less. However, if you miss one nap, 
you're devastated for three days once you're in that. So it's, it's a very high rate. You have to have a lot of control over your schedule. Um, and so no, I don't know too much about, I have not really gotten that involved in, in things that go outside of, of the human norm of sleep. Um, you can do all, but you know, a lot of people um, do wake up in the middle of the night at two in the morning and they're just awake for an hour and they fall back asleep and that's just part of normal. So I think this myth of, of people falling, being unconscious for eight continuous hours as the only acceptable sleep experience is, is probably not that accurate. So, yeah. Uh, you can take your pulse. And if you breathe in, your pulse will speed up a little bit. And if you breathe out, especially very slowly, your pulse will slow down. And that's a sign of relaxation. If you're highly stressed, that won't be nearly as noticeable. So you can look at the beat to beat, you know, your heart rate going across, and you can look at the variability in the spaces between the beats um, over time and how it's sort of, in mathematical terms, the first derivative of your heart rate. Um, and, and if the first derivative is making a nice sinusoidal pattern with a good amplitude, that means that's a sign of being well rested, relaxed, f mentally focused, emotionally balanced. Um, there are some devices. One is called the M Wave. It's by a company called HeartMath. That is specifically, you put your finger on it, and it basically is a biofeedback device, and it tells you how coherent your heart rate is, which is a measure of kind of a computed measure based on heart rate variability. And then it, it coaches you through a paced breathing exercise to get you into a relaxed state, and you get visual and auditory feedback based on your heart rate variability. So um, the hard part is measuring to date with commercially available technology is that most of the chest straps couldn't capture beat to beat data and you didn't have any way to look at heart rate variability in a moving person um, because the M wave you need a little ear clip or a finger on a button and it doesn't work when you're moving uh, because of motion artifacts so now you there's a whole list of, of sensor of straps that will sync to an iPhone app and I you know we've um, been experimenting with that but it's um, there's a lot of data in the research and literature about heart rate variability, but in terms of applied to everyday life, it hasn't really been uh, widely applied. Um, so I think it's just something that we're, we're experimenting with. Getting real, real live data in vivo has been hard until very recently, so we're just gathering, we're just gathering data ourselves right now. So. Okay, the question is sort of what is the most important parameter of sleep? Is it REM sleep? Is it something else? Uh, she has a little band that tracks your sleep. The, a lot of these devices track your sleep by looking at small movements during sleep, and they can tell whether you're awake or whether you're asleep by, your, by how much you move around. It turns out that's not bad for getting total sleep, but in terms of getting the quality of your sleep or your sleep architecture, it's, pretty, it's not very accurate. Um, so there, it, now that Zio went out of business, there's not a great answer to get your actual sleep architecture. Um, in my impression, not being a sleep specialist per se, but being interested, um, deep sleep seems to be more physically restorative, whereas REM sleep seems to be more mentally restorative. Um, so you need both. Um, your sleep in the beginning of the night is often, um, there are periods of deep sleep alternating with light sleep, and then you transition into um, blocks of REM alternating with light sleep. So you get more deep sleep up front and then you get more REM sleep later in the night. And that's why you often have dreams in the period before you wake up, whereas you're not, which is during REM sleep. So many people seem to have strong opinions about that, about how much sleep does a human need. Um, you know, somewhere in the seven to nine hour range is, I would say, the majority of people you know, some people need seven and some people need nine. Um, but there are some genetic short sleepers who need three. And they're very fortunate because um, <laughs> they don't sleep. They just, you know, and they're fine. But a lot of people who think they don't need a lot of sleep are kidding themselves. And they're too cognitively impaired to notice. <laughs> so... <laughs> so um, so I would say, you know, but just because you're in bed for eight hours doesn't mean you're getting good quality sleep, that you're getting good enough REM and enough. So you can wake up totally dragged out, tired, not remembering a thing, but that doesn't mean that you've slept well. So, yep, it might be. 
I mean, if you really have good energy and you wake up and you're happy with your sleep and you're getting some, you dream sometimes, and I, mean, I wouldn't necessarily rock the boat. I don't think you have to pathologize everybody. Um, what, whatever your sleep arc, it is working for you. But if it's not working for you and you have questions, then sometimes looking into it more is really, it can be really helpful. And some people do need a commercial grade sleep study. Um, some people can use one of these devices just to get an idea. What types of devices would be most useful for a cyclist? I guess there's two categories. There's sort of like the training thing, and then there's sort of like the life tracking, you know, general health thing. Um, for the training thing, I mean, it seems to be either some power meter or um, good cycling computer and hooked up to some platform like Strava or Training Peaks or um, whatever you want to use um, is pretty essential to modern training. You know, you need, and how much you want to shell out for a power, you know, for how good data and whether, you know, if you have, you know, the same power meter set up as the, you know, postal service team, um, is that, you know, a good thing or not? It depends on, you know, some, some you know, so that's, that's just a personal choice of how much money you want to spend to get how much. I don't think there's a huge benefit unless you're very competitive and they're really optimizing to getting, you know, to getting every bell and whistle. Now then in the, in the light, I'm really a big fan of this Lumo back that I'm wearing just because posture has been a bugaboo of mine for a long time. And, uh, and I think it's a cool little device that it's, it, they made the right trade-offs between performance and battery life. And it just kind of, is a, it's, you get, you get enough data to be useful without it um, being too, too, uh, too, too difficult. As far as the pedometer kind of things go for tracking your non-cycling workouts, um, if you're willing to wear an armband, then the body media fit or sync, they have a bunch of models that sync through your phone or whatever. And, um, they're the most accurate that I know of. Um, but if you don't want to wear that, uh, an armband, then the, then the Fitbit is, it's a little clip thing. It goes onto your clothing or whatever. And my problem with that was I just, I lost three and I gave up. They, they, <laughs> they, they, they kept coming off my, my clothes. So, um, so that's, and the Z, I was a big fan of the Zio for, for the people for whom it worked and that could tolerate a headband. Um, there are, I don't know, I, I don't know of any others that are replacing that. Um, um, yeah, in terms of, I think Strava seems to be the consensus for the platform that people share data on the most. Um, any other thoughts? I think that those are my personal favorite. And then if you want to get into active tracking of symptoms or of, active things that you need to put in, um, Mimey is kind of the coolest little app, but it's not, it's mostly going to be available to people like coaches who are working with people. It's more sort of, it's not really going to be released as a public app, I don't think, um, at least not in the, in the immediate future. But there are many, many, many apps like that. The one for behavior change that I think is cool is called Lyft. It's a way you can set little things you want to do every day and you can record that you did them and it gives you little kudos. And then other people who have chosen the same thing, like floss every day or go on a ride, can give you props for you know, doing that and, and, and support you. And it's actually, it's a cool little, it's a cool little app. So I think, I think that's been, been pretty fun. But there's, there's a lot out there and there's a lot more, more every day. So it's, it's just a matter of not getting overloaded and picking a couple things that you, you think meet your needs, so. Thanks. Thank